story of Eileen Hall's wartime service is one of perseverance, bravery, and ultimately, hope. It would take her on a journey halfway around the world, but it all started in a small Ohio town when she met the man who would become her husband. We just kind of hit it off right away. So then we started dating. It wasn't long after that till he was in the military. After he was sent in the service, I told him I had always wanted to go to California, so I was going to get on a bus and go to California. And he said, well, on your way, could you stop in Oklahoma and see me before you go? And that's as far as I got. After I was there a week, we got married. But the newlyweds' time together was limited. Only a few days after their wedding, Eileen's husband, Ken, was sent to Europe to engage in the fight against the Axis forces. But Eileen was not satisfied to sit and wait. And one day, I called the place where they were taking recruits for the Army. I really wanted to go in the Navy because I'd always been a swimmer all my life, practically. And when I went down to register, I said, I told him that. And he said, well, you have to be 21 to go in the Navy. But in the Army, you can go at 20 if you have your parents' consent. So I went down to, took the paper down to where my dad worked. And he said, well, I might as well do this or you do something else crazy. So he signed for me. So then, you know, I enlisted and on my 20th birthday. Eileen had been accepted into the Women's Army Corps, also known as the WAX. Even in the earliest stages of her military service, Eileen refused to settle for average. She was determined to see the world and give her best for her country. We had to take a test to see what we're we were qualified for, and I thought, oh, gosh, I hope I don't get cooking bakery. But I was always a tomboy, you know, and out of 85, four of us got chosen for the motor car. Now part of an automotive unit, when the opportunity finally came to go overseas, Eileen quickly volunteered and was soon on a ship to England. I was stationed there for a year. I drove, I was the personal driver of a Jeep. And the four of us that were drivers all drove an officer, so we had our own quarters because we were on 24-hour-a-day call. So I was called out night and day and whenever. Through character and a positive outlook, Eileen always had a natural gift for making friends, even among her commanding officers. And at my 21st birthday, I celebrated in England, and my officer that I drove had a party for me. And all the party was there were officers. I was the only one that wasn't. And they were all celebrating my birthday. I don't think I'll ever forget that one. But Eileen's time in England was far from routine. Although the British had held off the Germans from accomplishing a successful invasion, they still had to endure the perpetual threat of enemy bombing raids. We could always tell when there was going to be a raid on the, on the mainland because they'd all form over where we were. You could hear the motors going and everything. We knew there was going to be an air raid. And then after a year there, I was sent to the 23rd base post office in Paris, France. While I was stationed there, I got a letter from my husband. He was in Italy. He was in the field artillery on the big guns. He saw a lot of things. He didn't like to talk about what he went through. Eileen was thrilled to receive the letter and learn of her husband's location. But it wouldn't be until years later that she would know just how close she was to losing him. Ken was involved in five major battles on the Italian front. One night, he volunteered to cover the lookout shift of a fellow soldier who was too terrified to leave the safety of their foxhole. Ken had barely reached his post when the foxhole he had just left took a direct hit from a German artillery shell, killing every man in it. Ken was lucky, but there was still an entire war separating him from his wife. In December of 1944, with most of his forces in retreat, Adolf Hitler would rally every man he could to stage a surprise attack against the advancing Allies. The Battle of the Bulge was Germany's last major offensive in the war. The Allies would eventually achieve the victory, but suffered more than 80,000 casualties over 40 days of combat. The Battle of the Bulge was over, but there were so many wounded soldiers from Belgium that they had to bring some into Paris. The hospital 
administrator called our commander to see if they could send some wax up to help them because they were bringing the soldiers in into the lobby of the hospital and they just couldn't handle them. I filled up a ton and a half truck with wax and we drove to the the hospital. Here's all the GIs on stretchers on the floor and you could just about walk sideways to them and we just spread out and lean down and every one of the wax would, you know, where, where are you from? Gave them water. Whatever you could do to make them happy, you know, you did. And one fella had his leg amputated from his down here and he was going to be sent home and he said he hated to go home without seeing Paris. So I went to my commanding officer and told her the story. So she let me take the Jeep, two waxing back and me, and we go to the hospital and pick him up and took him all around Paris. As the war in Europe came to a close and Germany finally surrendered, Eileen found herself right in the middle of the celebration in Paris. The parade was something. I mean, they turned on all the lights and oh, it was a night that I'll never forget, never. For Eileen, the celebrations would be short-lived. Another letter from her husband, Ken, would reveal that he was now to be sent to the still ongoing war against the Japanese. When I got the letter from my husband that he was gonna be sent to this CB, the China-Burma area, which was still fighting, I, I started crying and my barracks was below the officers and she wanted to know what was the matter why I was crying and I told her I got a letter from my husband that he was going to be sent to the CBI and I, I wanted to see him if I could. Sympathetic to her situation, Eileen's commanding officer wrote up the paperwork assigning her to General Mark Clark's army in Italy. In truth, Eileen's new orders were just an excuse to get her to Ken. A driver from our outfit drove me out to Orly Airport I went into the office and told my story that I was trying to get to Italy. And he said, well, that plane out there is going to Italy. We'll hold it for you. One GI got on one side with his arm under here and the other one on the other side. And they picked me up. They had opened the bomb bay doors. They picked me up and put me where the gun turret was. And that's where I rode. Then I got to Leghorn and that was the end of my ride. That was because I didn't know where my husband was, but I knew he was in Italy somewhere. I started hitchhiking, and a truck come along with two English soldiers. I told them my story, and they said, well, we're going to Rome, you can go with us. They took me to the American Red Cross. They put me up for the night, and the next morning it was Sunday, and they were having a service. And so I went into the service and sat down, and a little bit later, another GI came in, and he looked at my patch. And he, he knew I wasn't from around there. And he says, oh, where, where are you from and what are you doing here? And I said, I'm looking for my husband. And I told him my story. And he says, well, you just wait here after the church service. I'll go see my commanding officer and see what I can do. To make a long story short, he was allowed to take me. He found out that my husband was in Milan and we were in Rome and Milan is way up at the top. So he picked me up and took me and we went through the Po Valley and the Apennine Mountains and arrived and half an hour before I got there, my husband knew I was coming. Nearly three years after their wedding, Eileen and Ken were finally reunited for the honeymoon they never had. Knowing Ken was soon to be sent to the CBI, Eileen was determined to fit a lifetime into those few short days. They worked it out so that we could go to the 5th Army Rest Camp, and that was at Lake Como, Italy. And we had a 10-room villa all to ourselves for eight days. Eight days came and went and soon it was time to once again part ways. Eileen returned to England, and after a few months, was on a ship back to America. After three years of wartime service and a journey that took her across Europe, if only to spend a few moments with her husband in the middle of a world war, Eileen was finally discharged from the army. She then boarded a train back to her hometown in Northeast Ohio. When she reached her final destination, 
there was a familiar face waiting for her. When we pulled in at the train station in Canton, my husband was there. He got home a week before me. To be home again, oh boy, it was something. It, it was great. I mean, you know, being together again. The war with Japan had finally ended, and Ken was never sent to the CBI. The two were finally free to settle down and start their life together. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Now currently we're releasing one episode a month, but if you'd like to help us get to the place where we can release more content more frequently, please consider supporting us through Patreon. Now if you're unfamiliar with Patreon, it's a subscription-based service that helps support creators like us. You can check out more in the link below. Another great way you can support us is to share these stories. Share them on social media, share them with your family and friends. It's a great way to honor these veterans. One final way you can support us is to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Thanks again for watching.